Thank you, Min. I, I, I'm very happy to be here. I've been getting a great education, uh, um, including you know uh, how somebody from Massachusetts has to be able to interact with people who are much friendlier than what we are up in Massachusetts. We were talking about that earlier, and we'll stay away from that topic. Um, I want to tell you about uh, what my group has been doing, and we were just talking about this for almost 20 years. So I'm going to take 20 years of data and cram it into about 55 minutes. But I want to talk to you about how we hope and think that computer vision, machine learning, computer science are going to help revolutionize medicine. And I want to start with a, a challenge. So you have the misfortune of having a tumor right up here. It's right close to motor cortex. Um, what happens is as the tumor grows, it starts pushing on motor cortex, you start having seizures. They get more common. They really threaten your quality of life. And so obviously you would like that tumor to come out. So you go in and see your surgeon and your radiologist and uh, what they do, these are great pictures to put up, right? I understand if you get really queasy, the restrooms are out there somewhere, so bear with me. Uh, a traditional situation is that a surgeon basically sees surfaces. So what happens? You go into the hospital, they put you in an MR, in an MR scanner, they build an MR scan of your, of your um, brain, which is what you're seeing across the bottom there. I'm just going to rerun it again. Don't have it in a loop. You build a nice 3D model. Sorry, I won't say. You build a nice 3D image of your brain. You find where the tumor is. You get wheeled into the OR. You're on the OR table. Your head is here. And slices of that image are over on the side wall on a light table. And your surgeon is looking at that light table and looking at you. At this point, you want to pray that your surgeon was a math major. Maybe it's a little surprising. Why? Because you want to hope that they are really good at geometric transformations. Because they're looking at the light table and deciding where to cut. I don't know about you, but I'm not thrilled about somebody rooting around in my brain with a spoon looking for X marks the spot to take out the tumor. I do not mean to make light of the surgeons. I'll do that later because it's a tough challenge. What they have to do is they see surfaces. What you're seeing there is in fact, it's called a craniotomy. You're actually seeing an exposed uh, cranium or uh, cortical surface of a patient and the surgeon has to figure out where should I cut. What we wanted to do, what we took as a challenge, we said, you know what, we want to turn a neurosurgeon in particular, but surgeons in general into superman or superwoman. We want to give them x-ray vision. We want to let them look at a patient and see through the skin and bone to all of the internal structures. We want to label those structures so that as the surgeon, in fact, insert, inserts an instrument into the surgical cavity, we'll show him or her exactly what is beneath that instrument. And in fact, what you see is a nice 3D model, which we're going to talk about building on the side. And in this early system, as the surgeon moved that instrument around, that arrow over there would update in real time. And down here across the bottom, we would update in real time through the MR volume, showing the surgeon exactly where the tip of that instrument is. We wanted to let them see before they cut. You know, I'll note to you parenthetically that every time we suggested, especially to a neurosurgeon, that we could turn him or her into Superman or Superwoman, we usually got a quizzical look and a suggestion that they didn't need any help in achieving that status and maybe you've met some of these folks and I've just insulted every uh, surgeon in the audience but it was fun nonetheless to say we're going to give you x-ray vision. We want to help you see through skin and bone. And so let me show you very quickly at high level and then we'll talk about some of the details how we're going to do this. So we're going to start with an MR volume. You're going to see right up here, right there is a tumor. And what we want to do is we want to build a model of this that the surgeon can use for planning and for navigation. So to give you a sense of this, the kinds of things we're going to build are things like this. Where we're literally going to label or identify where are the vessels. That spaghetti-like stuff you see there, those are the cortical spinal tracts that are connecting up the motor cortex. The things you see highlighted in blue are the actual positions of the motor cortex. And we're going to build those models so that the surgeon can plan. Here is my best angle of attack to get that tumor out. Here's where I need to come in order to get to the tumor but avoid hitting things that I don't want to hit. And here's what my plan is to actually get through there. And throughout the surgery, we're going to let the surgeon have the ability to not only see those models but relate them back to the original underlying MR volume. So our goal is we want to build these 3D models, we want to line them up with the patient, we want to let the surgeon use them for actually executing the surgery. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the math behind this. There will not be a quiz at the end, so you can ignore the equations. But basically our challenge is we want to take a standard MR volume 
and we want to build a model, a geometric model that is patient specific of that patient's tissues. We want to add on to it a bunch of additional information and I want to highlight that because our goal here is to help make the surgeon a better surgeon. So that means not only do we want to let them see, see through skin and bone, we want to let them see things that they would not see even when the cortical surface was exposed. We'll go back to my example of the tumor up next to motor cortex. Even if I took a big cap of skull out and completely exposed the cortical surface, the surgeon still can't tell what motor cortex is. Now if you think about that, especially those of you who know some neuroanatomy, you say, now wait a minute, motor cortex is always in the same place in a subject. And you're right, unless there's a tumor in there that's pushing it out by two or three centimeters. The problem for the surgeon is cortic you know, cortex is cortex. It looks exactly the same. So we want to identify where are the key places, where is the functional cortex, and let the surgeon see that, augment that, that visualization so that they can actually see things they wouldn't see even if the, the, the cortical surface was exposed. We're going to talk about a set of techniques to do that. We're going to bring it all into a single common model and then we're going to line it up with the patient so that the, the surgeon can do augmented reality visualization as they go through it. So the examples, I hope those are visible. We've got a little bit of a glare here, but I hope you're going to be able to see those. These are examples of the kinds of models we're going to build. Um, we're going to primarily talk about neurosurgery. Um, I'll highlight, I'll come back to it at the end, the system we built with our collaborators at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Med, we used in about a thousand cases before we retired it. And so what you see here are examples. These are all surgical cases. Unfortunately, in many of those cases, those giant green things are tumors, and some of them are quite large, but we're gonna talk about how we help the surgeon pull them out. We can build other models, and we've done that. So tumor in the, in the throat, a knee, tumor at the base of the spine. And at the end, if you ask me, I'll tell you about other places we'll do it. Um, one of the things we've done is we've tried to explore other domains just to see how well the techniques work. And that's actually my knee there. Um, we, I wanted to be both a subject for this, also to see how much cartilage I had left in my knee. The answer is not very much. Um, you know, what we've done in terms of other things, for example, is I've been telling my graduate students, we're working through the things that I know are going to break on me. My knees are gone. I don't play tennis anymore. A couple of years ago, we started looking at prostate. I know at my age, that's going to be a problem. My students take some glee in observing that the first thing we started with is neurosurgery because they therefore conclude what broke first in my case, and <laughs> I tell them that they're right. One of the reasons we want to build it is that, I'm sure this is obvious to you, but the visualizations are tremendously valuable for the surgeon in planning. So I'm going to run that loop again. What you're seeing here is actually brains, sorry, vessels in the brain, and that thing right up at the top there it's what's called an AVM. It's an arteriovenous malfunction. It's where an artery and a vein have grown together. This is not something you want because the blood is getting mixed across those two systems in a place where it shouldn't. And so one of the things we want to do is provide this reconstruction so that the surgeon can decide where is it, how do I get at it. Um, we can do some fairly complex examples and I'm going to show you the technology in a second. This is a CT scan of, a, of the chest area. And one of the things we want to do is have a system that can automatically, in this case is using a level set method, pull out a very detailed and intricate reconstruction of the vessels in there. And if we can do that, oops, sorry, I did not want to do that. Let me do this. Yeah, I've seen that already. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. We can actually build a fairly accurate model of not only that vessel structure, but the width of the vessel. So we can basically measure curvature to identify places where there may be pinching or other structures going on. So it gives you a sense of the kind of, of model that we're going to build. One of the other things we did, and then I'll get to the details, is uh, when I reached my 50th birthday, I won't tell you how many years ago it was, but you can probably guess, uh, my physician said, happy birthday, you get to have a colonoscopy. He said, I was looking for something a little better, like an Xbox, but okay, a colonoscopy, it sounds fine. It made me think, it would be nice to think about doing a colonoscopy where you didn't actually have to go through it. And so I gave it as a challenge, actually, to a master's student, Leanna, or, or uh, Delphine Nain, saying, wouldn't it be neat if we could build a virtual colonoscopy machine? That is, take a scan of, of the lower intestine area, and then automatically segment out the, um, the, the, uh, the large and small intestine, and then fly a virtual camera through it. So we're literally doing that. What you see here is just the orientation of the camera relative to the CT scan, and you're gonna see a point here where we've color-coded by curvature um, spot. So there's gonna be a blue 
It's coming around the corner here somewhere. Right there. That's a potential polyp. Right? It's, a, it's a high curvature spot on the wall of the intestine. Now, if it's a virtual colonoscopy, of course, you know, I still have to, if there's a place where I need to worry about, I still have to go in and, and do the sample. But I have two advantages. One is I can tell the surgeon exactly where to go because I know the position of that relative to um, the body. And the second one is, in a traditional colonoscopy, it's hard to look around the corners when the, the, the intestine folds dramatically. And here we can give the surgeon any visualization of it. Um, the other reason I like this is I point out to my students, look, you know, if we ever really get tight on NIH funding, we've got an alternative source. I mean, this just screams video game, doesn't it? Gut Runner, Montezuma's Revenge, or something like that. We've got to be able to do something with it. Okay, the jokes are bad, I agree, but they keep you awake. What I've tried to do is show you, these are the kinds of models we want to build. What I'd like to do now is talk to you about how we build them. And I'm going to walk through literally about 15 years of history. I'm going to compress it in terms of how we built it because it lets you see how you add more and more knowledge, more and more information to create the kinds of tools that you want. So we're going to start by just building a statistical model of appearance, a little Bayesian classifier. We're going to use that to do our initial segmentation. We're going to see that it's not sufficient and we're going to start adding in the kind of knowledge that a good radiologist uses, like an atlas of where to expect structures, knowledge about what the shapes of structures normally are, and we're going to put them all together. All right, so a tiny bit of math. Here's our problem. We have an MR scan. What I'd like to do is to label every voxel, every element in that volume by what kind of tissue is there. I want to know, is this white matter? Is this gray matter? Is this bone, skin, cerebral spinal fluid? So this is a labeling problem, and where basically what I'm saying is for every voxel X, I want to know what's the tissue type that best predicts that appearance, that is most likely to say, boy, if this tissue was white matter, this is the most likely thing I'd see there. So the way to think about this is I'm just taking a little expectation book and says, how do I maximize the appearance given that I believe that's the tissue type that is present there? And I'm going to do that for all of the elements. Here's the easiest way to do it. You sit a radiologist down in front of a, a monitor, you give him a mouse, and you say, please identify a set of points whose content you really know. So click on like 20 points of bone, record the intensities there. Click on 20 points of blood vessel, record the intensities there. Build a little statistical distribution, a little, a little um, measurement, if you like, of what those tissues look like in, in this, these images. And then when you get a new scan in, you just do nearest neighbor. That is, for every voxel, you say, what is the tissue type that most closely predicts this. And what you see down here, in fact, is this is just a little scatter plot. Along the bottom, uh, bottom is what's called proton density. It's one of the things you can measure in an MR volume. And along here, this is T2 weighted um, intensity. Point is, you can see how there's sort of our Gaussian distributions there. And another way of thinking about this is, this is basically a mixture of Gaussians fit to that data. But you just train it up with the radiologist. And here's what you get. This is from a study we did about 12, 15 years ago, um, this is a patient with multiple, I can never say that clearly, multiple sclerosis. So there's actually a white matter lesion right here that you can see changing in size. But it's a setup where each of these uh, MR volumes was taken about six weeks apart. So it's part of a longitudinal study. And we've tried to set it up so we're taking exactly the same cross-sectional uh, slice to it. So the point is you're looking at the same portion of the patient here. You take that simple statistical classifier and you'd run it and you get this. And I'll let you look at that for a second. Notice that in the space of six weeks, this patient's brain shifted entirely from gray matter to white matter. I said to my graduate students, there are two possible outcomes. Outcome number one, we're going to Stockholm. We're going to get this little medal to put around our neck. Outcome number two, we have a bug in our coat. Which one do you think is more likely? <laughs> And they mostly picked the right answer. And in fact, that's unfair. We did not have a bug in our code. We had a flaw in our thinking. And this is something that can trap you if you come to a new field as a computer vision person and you don't pay attention to the field. So what's the flaw in our thinking? The problem is that what's an MR machine? It's a giant magnetic field. It's actually a big radio if you want to think of it that way. But it's really hard to build a magnetic field big enough in which to insert a human that is perfectly uniform. As a consequence, if I take a little piece of tissue like white matter, I put it in one place in the field, 
it will give back a response that has a particular intensity. As I move it in the field, the exactly the same tissue type will have a different response because there's a nonlinear gain artifact inside that field. Don't go sell your GE stock or your Siemens stock. It's not their fault. It's just really hard to make a field that big. Moreover, as you put objects in it like a human, they actually shift the field around a little bit. So the problem is that what is going to be one intensity in one place is going to be a different intensity in another place. You've got this nonlinear gain field. You'd like to get rid of it. <clears throat> so um, this says you're caught between Scylla and Charybdis, or if you were not a humanities major at Harvard, a rock in a hard place. The Harvard guys don't like that joke either, by the way. Why do I say that? Um, I've got this gain field. I'd like to get rid of it. So how could I get rid of it? Well, look, if I knew what the gain field was, I could take the scan and I could correct it, just like you do in Photoshop, right? I could change it, correct the image, and then my, statist yeah, my statistical classifier ought to work great. So all I need to do is figure out the gain field. So how do I get the gain field? Well, look, if I knew what the tissue types were, if I had a model of the patient, I could predict what the image should be, I could take the image, I could take the difference, and I get the gain field. And you see the problem. Uh, I'm caught in an infinite loop, right? If I knew the gain field, I could figure out what the tissue types are. Oh, damn, if I only knew what the tissue types were, I could figure out what the gain field is. This does sound like an infinite loop. Uh, even at MIT, we know those are a bad thing. And fortunately, there's a wonderful technique, which is pretty common these days, to get around it, which is called expectation maximization, a great statistical technique. And I'm going to show you in a second that lets us solve for both the gain field and the tissue classes at the same time. A little bit of annoyance here. I'd like to point this out. This is the work of a former student of mine, Sandy Wells, who's now a full professor of medicine at Harvard. To my knowledge, this is the first place where EM was used in a vision context. So it dates from about 1992 or 93. And I'd like to point it out because it's now become a very common thing and it's a great tool to have. So how does this work? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to simultaneously solve for what's the label and what's the gain field that lets me predict the image. And let me just show you what that means with one more equation. I promise there aren't a lot of them. This does look ugly, but it's not bad. Basically, this goes in two steps. In the first step, at every voxel, I'm going to build a little vector that's a weight vector that says, for this voxel, here's the probability this voxel is white matter, gray matter, CSF, whatever my set of classes are. And it comes from two pieces. The top piece says simply, what's the probability if I knew what the gain field was and what the tissue type was that it has that intensity? And those are just Gaussian distributions, standard normal distributions, shifted or offset by the gain field, okay? And that's multiplied by a prior probability, which is what's the probability that that tissue type is there? And initially, that's just going to be a stationary probability, or in less highfalutin terms, we're simply going to take the overall average volume of white matter to the, to the head or gray matter to the head and say, that's my prior probability. It's clearly wrong, but we're going to start there, and we're going to see how to fix it. So I measure the prior probability straightforwardly. I measure the Gaussian by just building a Gaussian distribution and shift it by, by the, 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 the gain factor. And I normalize it. That gives me my weights. And notice it says, I know, I'm assuming I know what the gain field is. Having done that, I then fix those weights and find the maximum likelihood estimate of the gain field. Don't sweat the equations. It simply says it's two simple little statistical steps. Let's see what happens. Now, instead of going from here to there, I go to there. And you can look at it and say, boy, even if you don't know a lot of neuroanatomy, you can see that it looks like it is labeling the same things the same way across all of these images, which is great. Wonderful. We finished the talk in 15 minutes. Well, it's not quite done, and you can probably figure that out by where the time is. This is a great start. It does really well, but it has a couple of problems. It works well on distinctive tissue types, white matter, gray matter. But I want to get more subtle problems, more, more subtle types out as well. So I don't know how well you can see this, but if you look in this region here, you'll notice it's slightly darker than the regions around there. It's actually an important structure. That is uh, the amygdala hippocampus com uh, complex, which I want to pull out. How do I find it? Well, if I told you, look, here's where you normally see that. I told you that is the normal place where you would see that structure. It's a little easier to combine this 
with that to figure out where to find the boundary. And that's what a radiologist would do. So I want to do the same thing. So we need to build an atlas, a, a neuroanatomical <coughs> atlas of where structures normally are. We know they're going to vary from patient to patient or subject to subject. So here's how we do it. We take 50 normal subjects. And I got to tell you, I love that phrase. I have no idea what a normal subject is. I can tell you that these 50 people were all Harvard students, which makes me really nervous. But we did not use any MIT students, so we know we're more likely to be normal than not. All right, so we take 50 subjects and we do the following. And I'm going to spare you the details, but we basically perform what's called an elastic registration in, in, in computer vision. That is, we say, how do we warp one image so that it mostly aligns up intensity-wise with the other one? We pick one of the subjects as the canonical subject. So each one of those red arrows there, if you like, is, a, is an elastic transformation that warps each image into this canonical image. We then take each of those 50, 50 subjects and we do segmentation. We do this process of building a labeling of all of the tissue types. And then we apply those warps. So what you see down here is these are the white matter segmentations of four of the subjects. We warp them all to a common coordinate frame and then we just count. What percentage of the time is this voxel white matter? What percentage of the time is it gray matter? And you can see there are some places which are very consistently white matter. And then as you get out to the edges, it gets less certain. But there are other places that are clearly not white matter. Okay, so we're going to use that. And you can probably already see what I'm going to do. I'm going to now change my prior probability. Rather than saying everything has equal likelihood of being a particular type, there are particular places where I expect it to be of that type. And I'm going to use that. I'm going to use one other, sorry, how do I line those up? Well, I basically need to take a new image in and, and, and warp it to the same place. And here I just do it in two stages. I do an overall affine warp to line up the head or the image, if you like, with the model. And then I do a local warp of each of the structures. And so this is a simple piece of, of uh, registration to make it happen. Okay. That'll get me close. But I want to do one last thing. So why does that get me close? That tells me where to expect the boundaries. But even if I know where to expect the boundaries, some of the boundaries are going to be really hard to find. In computer vision terms, there are no edges there. There's just simply a blending of intensities. But a radiologist is not going to have a problem doing the segmentation because they know what the typical shape of a structure is. So I want to give the same knowledge to my system. Sorry, and I'm going to do this in the following way. I'm going to train the system on a set of manually segmented models. And for those of you who've seen this, I'm going to use a very simple technique. I'm going to build, I'm going to segment out a bunch of examples of a particular structure, and I'm going to build what's called a distance transform. If you haven't seen that, it simply says, if it's a 2D image and I've got a boundary, at every point in that image, I'm going to record what's the distance to the closest point on the boundary, and I'm just going to make a little image out of that. I'm going to sample those things some regular spacing that gives me a vector in a very high dimensional vector space. And then I'm just going to do principal components analysis. I'm going to say what is the mean shape in that space and what are the standard modes of deformation of those shapes. So let me show you what happens if you do that. We're going to take a set of 50 examples of a corpus callosum and my Latin is terrible. I think the plural is corpora callosa. I don't know if you know better, tell me later on. What you see up there are examples. This happens to be in 2D. We're going to do it in 3D. And in fact, the image you see is an example of a distance transform. You can see how the intensity gets uh, higher as you get further away. You can also see the variation in it. What we do is we train the system so that the average corpus callosum looks like that Pringles potato chip at the bottom. And then we can say, what are the standard modes of deformation? What are the primary ways in which this changes? And I really like this because notice the largest one is basically size. The second dominant mode is basically bending. How much does this structure bend? And the third and fourth dominant modes are essentially how much weight do you have on one end or the other. And here's what I'm going to do with it. Having built this model, this is now a probabilistic model. So it tells me, look, when I'm trying to do this segmentation, I know where to look for the boundary, but I also know if I'm trying to complete an edge, I can tell you what's the most probable completion, what's the most likely way to complete it. And let me show you. So these are just examples of corpus callosa. I think C is an example of something close to an average. But notice even right here, there's no clear edge there. This is because the fornix right here has almost the same intensity. And that's going to be one of the challenges. And you can see they come in a range of, 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 of uh, sizes. 
And here's what happens if you do that segmentation. The blue line is what you would get with just a standard deformable contour, a snake if you're familiar with the term. And the, the red and purple line are just different stages in the, in the segmentation. So what this algorithm has learned is that the most likely boundary completes through there. It is really unlikely that it pulls out into this other side structure. And this is exactly what a radiologist would do. Okay, so one of the questions that you ought to be thinking about is, first of all, will this talk get over soon? The answer is yes, about 35 minutes. Secondly, are there bad jokes? Yes, of course. The third one, though, is, more importantly, how do you know you're right? So I'm building this knowledge into this algorithm, but how do I actually know that I'm right? Uh, for those of you, and I know there are many people in the audience that do medical image analysis, this is one of the real challenges in this field, which is what is ground truth? You know, I once said to my students, look, do you mind if we microtome your brain and just see, you know, we give us some ground truth, you could be a great contribution to science, they all declined, quite correctly. Um, it's hard to know where the ground truth is. So the closest thing you can do, I think, is to have an expert do it. So we did the following test. We took a, a, a great Harvard radiologist and we had him segment out 50 different corpus callosa, just manually with a mouse as best he could. We had a second radiologist do the same set of 50 cases and we measured the difference between the two of them to try and give us a sense of not necessarily where ground truth is, but just how much variation is there. And so what you see here in the um, red line is the difference between one radiologist and another. Uh, on the, and they're uh, sorted in an order, I'll come back in a second. The measure we're using, if you, if you care about it, is something called the Hausdorff distance that, that vision people know. It doesn't really matter, it's just a, st yeah, a statistical way of measuring difference. The blue line is what the computer did. And that's what I want you to see, is that basically the kind of deviation you see with a couple of exceptions between the automatic system and a radiologist is no different than between two radiologists. And that's encouraging. It says we're at least as good as a radiologist in making this distinction. The uh, weird cases at the end there are places where, especially at the boundaries of the corpus callosum, in one case the computer algorithm had a hard time. And yeah, I agree, one of my bad cases is not good, but otherwise what I'd like you to see is just basically they are comparable. Okay, so how do we put this together then? We just need to add those shape priors in. And the most recent version of this is, um, I'm going to just skip through quickly, is it turns out that what you can do is line them all up, and if you do one last trick, which is to convert each one of those distance maps into what's called a log odds map, in which you use distance to define probabilities we did before, and then you take the ratio of the probability over one minus the probability. Why in the world would you do it? You convert this into a vector space. And that's really useful because I want to be able to take multiple examples of segmentations and perform algebra on them. I want to add them together and expect that what I get back out is another instance of distance map. You can't do that with distance maps. It turns out you can do it with log odds. So I simply want to point this out. You turn this into a vector space, it means you can do all the manipulations we just talked about. And so when we put it all together, you build those shape models, you build that probabilistic atlas, and now you just solve a little bit larger expectation maximization problem. I know you can't read the equations at the back of the hall, you shouldn't care either. They're simply an expectation maximization thing that says, I have a set of probabilities that I've measured, I have a set of things that I'm going to estimate along the way, and I just run through this cycle, typically converges in about four or five steps. And that lets me simultaneously solve for the registration or alignment, the labeling of the structures, and the identification of the subtle boundaries. And remember that image I showed you where I've put overlays on here to let you see them. That boundary is incredibly hard to find just in the intensities, but with the knowledge of where to expect it and with the knowledge of what the shapes are, the algorithm does a very good job of actually identifying it. Just to give you a sense of this, and then we'll talk about using it, uh, I want to show you some examples. And there, I'm going to show you a more detailed one, but basically you can see the difference here between adding in the knowledge of shape and not. So the EM segmenter is just that traditional statistical one. It does well on easy structures, but when you get down into subtle structures, like the one shown here, it makes mistakes. Whereas if you get to the, uh, um, um, the full use of shape, it actually does a great job. And just to show that a little bit better, in essence, what this slide says is for a whole range of different structures, on average, you're right about 95% of the time. 
Now that's a funny number. You know, my reaction is right, and if the 5% is the tumor, I'm not thrilled with this, and of course that's right. We can look at where the errors lie. They tend to lie on thin structures, which are hard to segment out, and they tend to lie on borders of structures. And for surgical cases, that's probably okay, because a tumor, if, sorry, if a surgeon's gonna take out a tumor, they're gonna take a margin around it. They're not gonna leave things behind. Uh, but we still have a little bit of work to do. Obviously, I'd like it better than 95% or 94%, but it's a great start. Okay, so I built a structural model. I'd like to add to it. Now, again, I'm going to go back to my example. Don't worry, we're going to get the tumor out. Um, but I'll go back to my example. Is even if I build a great structural model of where that tumor is, I want to help the surgeon identify things to avoid. It doesn't help a lot to say, I got good news and bad news, right? I got the tumor out. Guess what? You're paralyzed for life. I don't mean to make light of it, but hitting the motor cortex is really a danger. And motor cortex is not visible to the surgeon. So there are a number of ways we could do this. One of them is to use, again, a technique I suspect many of you have heard of, FMR, functional MR, in which you actually basically measure the oxygenation rate in the brain and use that to identify it. I want to show you a second technique that we've used called uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is kind of a, a, a neat idea. This is my former student and colleague, Mike Leventon. So here's what we're going to do. If I take a pair of electromagnets and I create a figure eight like shape, such as you see there, um, and I wind them so they're basically of the same strength. If I put a current through those electromagnets, I'm gonna create a magnetic field that has the property that right through the axis between them, the field is symmetric and there's a hot spot whose position will move on as, as a function of how much current I put through the electromagnets. But because that magnetic field drops off as a fourth order power, it's a very localized hot spot. So if I put that thing up against somebody's head, especially if I put it up here, and I fire about a 50 millisecond pulse of energy through it, I will stimulate about a cubic millimeter of brain. Okay? So here's what I do. I build that structural model of, from, from standard MR. I line it up very carefully with the patient. I'll talk about that in a second, or the subject, so that you know exactly the relationship geometrically between the patient and the, and the, sorry, the subject and the model. I put some markers, just some LEDs, on the subject so I know where they are and I put some markers on that magnet. I can basically stimulate a cubic millimeter of cortex and know exactly which cubic millimeter I stimulated. And the final thing I do is I put some electrical pickups on muscles, typically on the, the fingers and hand because they happen to be closer to the surface. Fire that pulse of energy and I record which muscle moves. And I'm going to do it in a very careful way to distinguish between involuntary things like, oh my God, somebody's zapping my brain from the actual stimulation of it. And if you do that, you can map out motor cortex. Um, that's actually my brain. Uh, and in fact, let me show you. In a younger day, I was a subject. Uh, the gray hair came after I did this. Uh, actually, it didn't. That's my motor cortex. That's my visual cortex. We actually mapped this out. Uh, and what's so... What's the point here? I can now paint on the surface of the model information for the surgeon. Here's an area to avoid. Here's where motor cortex is. Uh, I, I can't resist telling you a 30 second anecdote about this. This is a really interesting experience. Again, I asked for volunteers among my graduate students. They were all much smarter. One of them put it to me, look, if your PC breaks, you don't take a car battery and jumper cables to try and figure out what's wrong with your PC. So I was a subject in this, and um, this was done as a collaboration, which I didn't completely understand, between the Department of Psychiatry, the Department of Anesthesiology, the Department of Radiology, and the Department of Neurosurgery. And so that's Vern Gugino behind me, who's a neuroanesthesiologist. And we were doing this experiment, and he would basically talk down, and he'd go, three, two, one, zap, which is a wonderful phrase to use. The simulation is actually interesting because there are no pain receptors in the brain. They're only in the skin, and the magnetic field doesn't stimulate them, it just stimulates the brain. And we would I would describe what I was feeling as we did, and it was a little bit like the static shock with a, with a wool sweater in the winter kind of thing. But at one point, I said, oh, I felt my finger move. And Vern says, no, it didn't. I said, no, Vern, I felt my finger move. He said, no, it didn't. So because of the system, we could put the probe right back in exactly the same spot. He put it back in, I watched my hand, he did the stimulation, and I swore I felt my finger move, and it didn't something's broken, you know, <laughs> and I don't want to do this again. It took us a little while, but I think we eventually figured it out. Anybody know a little of neuroanatomy? Can you, yeah, what, what went wrong? Yeah. 
Yep. You're, cl you're real close. You're real close. No, you're real close. Um, and I'm now out of the camera view. Sorry about that. I'll move back into the camera. You're really close. So the answer is, uh, if you look at the brain, and I said 30 seconds and I took two minutes for the anecdote, but basically if you look at the brain, there's a big divide called the central sulcus. Motor cortex is on one side of central sulcus. Right on the other side of central sulcus is motor sensory cortex. It's, this muscle, sorry, it's the nerve cells that get the signals back from the muscle saying you moved. We got the angle off slightly, and so we basically bypassed the whole system. We directly stimulated motor sensory cortex, at least that's what we think, making me feel like it moved and it hadn't. My comment to Vern was, we gotta patent this. This is the world's best exercise regime. You could make somebody feel like they're really working out and they don't have to do anything. And then he pointed out, no, that's not why people want this. They actually wanna lose the weight. So we didn't patent it, but it was fine. The point of the bad story is it lets us build this nice model of structures that the surgeon needs to see. I want to show you one last piece and then I'm going to talk about surgical applications and then I'm going to try and leave time at the end to talk about some disease applications. The last piece is we'd also like to find the white matter fibers. So this is just a little reminder for you of some neuroanatomy that, that basically uh, cells in the brain have this structure of you've got the nucleus of the neuron, you've got this long fiber covered in a myelin and sheet that goes off to the terminal that basically wires things together. And one of the things you'd like to do is to figure out where those fibers are. And it turns out there's a, uh, there's a very clever technique in, in MR that lets you do this, which is based on Brownian motion, which sounds strange. Right? So, a water, so what's an MR machine? It's basically recording the position of water molecules in, in tissue. It literally takes the, the recession of, of the proton in the water molecule, lines it up, lets it relax, and you're listening to that energy coming back up that tells you what, what is there. So if you think about a water molecule, it's going to want to just diffuse randomly in one direction if there's nothing else around it. On the other hand, if I have a big long sheet of fibers, a big tube, it's much more likely that the water molecules will want to move along the tube than they will try and hit the edges of the tube. And so basically, that's what diffusion MR does. It takes a sequence of six quick images where you change the direction of the magnetic field, you record the intensities coming back out, and you can back out from that a local estimate at every point of how likely is, or how strongly is the texture of the fibers oriented, either in one direction, as a sheet, or just randomly. And basically, you build this little tensor model where you literally take those, uh, there's six measurements in there because it's a symmetric matrix. You solve a little matrix equation to find the dominant direction, so the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, and it lets you measure how strongly oriented are fibers in a place. One of the things you can now do is you can pick one point along a fiber and simply walk along the dominant direction until it diffuses out, and you basically trace a fiber. What do you do if you get this, or what happens if you do this? Well, we're going to measure some things along there. I'm not going to I'll come back to that in a second. You can now create images that let you see how strongly fibers are oriented. Or to get to my favorite image, here's the wiring diagram of somebody's brain. What you're seeing here are tracing out of all the white matter fibers that connect things up. This is really valuable to a surgeon for two reasons. One is if I've got a tumor somewhere, I'm going to remove it, I'd like to know if I take this tissue out, what's it connected to? What's it likely to affect? And secondly, again, not only do I want to avoid motor cortex, I don't want to clip the cortical spinal tract, or again, I'm going to paralyze the patient. So I'm going to find those white matter fibers, and I'm going to identify them. And so that's what we do. We put all of this together. Structural MR, functional MR, angiography to get the vessels out. We do similar segmentation there. Diffusion tensor MR, the TMS, and we bring them all into a common coordinate frame. Um, and this is just to say we're basically going to align everything up. I'm going to skip by that. Let me show you how we use this. If I got that model together, I go back to my case in the surgery. I still want to relate it to the patient. I'd like to be at the case that as a surgeon touches a point in the patient, they know exactly where they are in that model. So let me show you how we do that. We take a fairly old technique, but a very nice little one, in which uh, we essentially, uh, I don't know if these systems still exist, they used to be called laser stripers. Take a little low power laser beam, like in a laser pointer, we run it through a cylindrical lens. That creates a sheet of light. Imagine I bounce it off of a mirror here whose position I can control. As I sweep the mirror, that sheet of light is gonna create a line that moves across this table. I put a camera over it on, at an angle here, and I record exactly where that, that line of light is as a function of the position here. 
Why would I do that? Well, if I put an object, like a head, in the field, it deflects the laser beam. And that's exactly what you see there. So we just sweep a little laser beam across the head of this patient. Each one of these lines is, is a line of laser light. We know the 3D position of that. We automatically segment out those points that come from the skin surface. And those are now a set of 3D lines. I take the skin of my model and I say to my computer, find a rotation and translation that exactly lines it up so that all of those points lie on the skin of the patient. And having done that, I now have transformed my model into patient coordinates. And that then allows me to line up my model exactly with a real-time view of the patient. That gray image you see there was a live view of the patient. The way it worked was the patient was here, the surgeon standing there, there's a monitor right in front of him or her, and he can see that in, in live view and overlaid on that model, just augmented reality visualization is an overlay of the patient. And of course we don't just want the skin, we want all the structures inside. And now as the surgeon moves his or her hands in that field, they can see what structures are below. Okay. I like to put this image up and I'll do it very briefly. This was the first case we did. Um, we did it in 1994, I think, uh, maybe 95. Uh, that giant green thing is a tumor. The young lady was 15 at the time. She's 30. And that's the nice part about doing this, is that we were able to help the surgeon decide how to get it out. He could have done it without us, but we were just a little bit better at helping him do it and to do it without any damage to the patient. During the surgery, we track the surgical instruments. We just put some markers on them and track them with a, with a set of IR cameras overhead. And one of the things that allows us to do then is to track throughout the surgery exactly where the tip of that instrument is and how it relates, as you can see here, to structures. In this case, the tumor is in green. It's very close to the surface. The surgeon has done the, 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 the um, um, removal of a piece of, cor uh, of a skull and has exposed the cortex and he's actually tracing the boundary of the tumor. These things across the bottom update in real time as he moves the probe around so he can see exactly where he is. There's also a lesson here I want to highlight because it's, it's you know, about to say it's easy to be arrogant. I guess MIT folks get accused of that all the time, so I need to live up to that reputation. But it's really easy to get very fixated on things that you think are cool and are useless to your end user. And that great 3D graphical image up in the right-hand corner is an example. When we first took this into surgery, we spent a lot of time building that 3D model, updating that arrow in real time. It was cool. And then we observed a bunch of surgeries with neurosurgeons and we looked at where they looked. And guess what? <laughs> they never looked at the 3D model. They looked at those cross sections. Sagittal axial coronal, they're trained to think that way. It means they can drive really well in cities with square streets, which explains the problems in Boston. But <laughs> you get the idea. They think in terms of these coordinates. And so after a few, a few um, trials, we dropped the 3D model and simply went to a display that made sense to the surgeon because they're our customer and we really want to make something of value to them. I hope in the future as more you know, video game players become surgeons, it's more likely that they'll think in 3D, but right now that's the way they think, so that's where we stick with it. Okay, and then basically we take it into surgery. So what we now do is we combine together vessels from angiography, the structural model, the functional model from TMS, the white matter uh, fiber tracks all together and we show the surgeon a visualization. And as you see here, that sort of jello-like looking green thing, I hope you can see it, there's a section right here where it looks like it envelops a portion of the cortical track. Surgeon looked at this ahead of time, made a decision that said I need to be really careful at that section. In fact, when he got into surgery, he removed most of that tumor. He left behind a tiny piece of tumor because he was concerned that it in fact was wrapped around the cortical tract. Now we can't prove it was or wasn't. What we can tell you is that the patient had no negative effects after the surgery. And the surgeon's concern was, if I take it out, there's a good chance that they aren't moving. This is something that obviously is ultimately a surgeon's decision, but it's where the visualizations provide some power for them, or at least we hope they do. And I'm just gonna show you a few other examples coming through surgery. There's a great view of the cortical spinal tracts coming up through that portion. Now you may wonder about this, okay, so you built this great model, but don't tissues move? So it's one of the great frustrations. You know, we build this beautiful model, we register it to submillimeter accuracy, and then the damn, sorry, the darn surgeon cuts something and tissues shift. 
course, that's their job. And so one of the things we had to worry about is, well, how do we adapt the model? And so in our case, we did this by some interoperative imaging. Uh, the Brigham has a, um, a um, what's called an interoperative MR machine. It's basically take a big MR machine. If you've been in it, it's like a giant tube. You cut a big section out of the middle. You leave basically two tori or two donuts at the end with a gap big enough for a surgeon to stand inside of. You put the patient inside of the scanner, you build an operating theater around it, and during the surgery, at any point, the surgeon could say, I'd like a new view through this point at this orientation. And that's what we've done here, is we've simply taken a new view, and when we do that, we then again do this little elastic warping to shift the tissues, carrying along with it all that additional information we had, and it allows us to update the view at any time. And what you're seeing here is just a, de a demonstration of how much the tissue shift. I've taken this image, you can see where the surgeons come in. I've just pulled some edges out of it and I've overlaid it on this image. And you can see that the tissues can shift, in some cases as much as a centimeter, which is obviously a serious amount of shift. And that allows us to update in real time. And we just simply do it by a little elastic warping algorithm that blinds them up. I'm gonna skip the, the, the video of the surgical example because I wanna spend the last um, 10 minutes talking about a different application. So what I've tried to show you so far, excuse me, is how building these models can be of real value in surgery. And at the end, if you'd like, you can ask me about sort of the surgical outcomes, but it lets a surgeon execute surgeries better. But building those models ought to be useful for other things. And I wanna highlight just at the end, a couple of other places where we can use it. The first one is if we can build these shapes, what if we did them across a whole bunch of subjects? Even better, what if we took 50 patients with a particular disease and 50 normals and asked the following question. Is there a statistically significant difference in shape of a particular structure between those two populations? So we did that. We took a set of schizophrenics, or people diagnosed with schizophrenia, and a set of normals. We segmented out the amygdala hippocampus. And what you see here are examples from normals and examples from schizophrenics. Any difference? Yeah, right. It's a little hard to see, but that's part of the point. So the game we're going to play is, given that we've got these complex shapes, we can ask a great machine learning question, which is, if I had a set that I knew were of one kind and a set I knew of another kind, I'd like to know for, a new, for any one of those examples, how do I have to shift it in this high dimensional space with minimal change in order to move it from one population to another? If this was a simple linear space, you're just finding the hyperplane that separates out the two things and you're just moving in a direction normal to that hyperplane. It's not a simple linear space, but it turns out you can play the same game. And there's a nice uh, idea called discriminative direction, developed by my former student, Polina Goland, that even in a high dimensional space lets you basically solve for what's the deformation that will take this example into the other class while minimizing any deformations that are, are irrelevant to the movement. So you're not going to twist along the surface, you're going to just move the surface. If you do that, you get some fascinating results. This basically says, in order to take this schizophrenic example and make it look like a normal, I need to compress it here, I need to pull it out there, but it's localized. It's not just a gross overall shape change. And we can do a sequence of these to determine where are the places where the shape changes are localized. We did this with a study with our colleagues at the Brigham. Uh, I guess a set of schizophrenics, a set of, of, of patients having what's called uh, a first effective disorder and a set of controls. We looked at a sequence of, of, of structures in the brain and we exact, asked exactly that question. Where are there statistically different, significant differences in shape? And what you see at the bottom here are the error bars essentially highlighting where those changes are. This replicated an early, earlier study that had been done very painstakingly by hand. What we found was that the computer system had better accuracy. And I want to show you one example, and I want to say this carefully because there's a camera rolling here. So I don't want you to go away thinking we've solved this problem, but it gives you a sense of why it can be intriguing. And I want to show you in particular, that's left superior temporal gyrus, in which you see that the schizophrenics have a significant difference in shape than either <coughs> effectives or normals. So why do I like this example? Anybody know what left superior temporal gyrus is involved in? There's no reason why you should. I don't expect you to. Uh, one of the things, among many things that it, it's involved in, is involved in hearing. So why do I like this example? What's one of the characteristics of some schizophrenics? Yeah? They hear voices. Exactly. Now, I need to say it carefully. Have we proved that? Of course not. 
But have we identified a localized change in shape for our colleagues that raises intriguing questions about how you might investigate that? We hope so. And that's literally what we're trying to do here. So let me finish in the last five minutes with showing you one more example of this. I'm going to again go back. I'm going to use my DTMRI. Uh, and I'm going to look at subjects that have issues. So in particular, what you're seeing right there is what's called the corpus callosum. Again, it's, if I didn't say this earlier, it's the sheet of fibers that connects the two hemispheres of the brain together. That's what lets the two parts of your brain communicate with each other. This is a subject with multiple sclerosis, and it turns out there's a white matter lesion right there. If I can measure how strongly oriented these fibers are with that DTMRI thing, I can also measure things like, well, I can measure exactly that. How strongly are they oriented? So there's this thing called... Uh, um, uh, fractional anisotropy, which is basically how much of a variation is there in, in orientation. And notice what that lesion does. It's like crimping a cable. It's pushing in and, and changing where that cable is. So we wanted to ask the same question, which is, can we measure in these images, using these shape measurements, where there are changes, significant changes in the orientation of the fibers? And I'm going to skip through some of the examples here. Uh, you don't really need to see all of this math. I want to get to the punchline. Like I said, you didn't want to see all that math. Okay, here we go. We're basically going to train a system that says when we give it a set of, of, of examples, the system from a single example, either sketched by a radiologist or a neuroscientist, or from a training example from an atlas, will automatically segment out the different portions of the fibers. So these, even though they're connected, are two different portions. And then, given that we can do that, we'll simply work out how to register all of those together and walk along them so that we can measure differences. So we do that segmentation. And here's what we find. We can basically say, because we've built those detailed shape models, because we can align them all together, we can now say, between those two populations, are there localized differences in connectivity? In the, in the, in the, and so what you see here, for example, for the genu and the upper and lower splenium, you're seeing the comparison between 50 normals and 50, 50 schizophrenics. And notice that for one of these, it's significant through the entire region. But for the genu, there are two places, halfway along, where there's a significant difference in the orientation of the fibers. I can't tell you what it's doing. What I can tell my neuroscience colleagues is we can identify for you the places where that seems to be a change. Let's now go figure out what's happening there, where they're connected to. We can do it for the cingulum. And here what you actually find is that there's a difference between the left and right cingulum in terms of where that happens. And we can do it also showing that there are asymmetries Again, left and right between the cingulum bundle that are stronger in schizophrenics than they are in normals. I'm doing this quickly. I don't expect you to see all of it. I want to just leave you with the message that says, having built these tools, we can actually help find changes that let a neuroscientist, let a neurosurgeon think about them. We can also even show that those changes are correlated with age. So that, that change in shape progresses over time, which is not surprising, but we can help quantify that for our neuroscience friends. So let me wrap this back up for you. And I want to leave you with a quote from my colleague Rick Satava, who um, is a, a, an army surgeon, was in the Surgeon General's office for many years, and a great surgeon who um, basically, I think, captured the excitement of why we're trying to get computer vision into medicine. As you can read from the quote, I slightly misquoted him, but basically, you know, the next generation surgeon is going to be the Nintendo surgeon. You can tell how long ago this quote comes from because Nintendo probably doesn't exist anymore, but the next Xbox surgeon, whatever. Totally at ease with augmented reality visualization, minimally basis procedures, and robotically assisted hand-eye coordination. I like the quote because you know, when my sons, who are now 20 and 22, but were younger, I could reassure my wife when they were spending far too much time in front of the video game, they're not wasting time. They're training to be a surgeon. Honest, it's okay for them to do this. <laughs> but it's what lets us get to providing the visualizations that we really do hope change how surgeons perform and hopefully augment their skills to let them perform better.